just yet. So we don't have an audience just yet. Okay, you all bet ready? And we're on. I want to welcome everyone to our COVID-19 Business Resources Series. This is session four. We're hosting Greater San Marcos Partnership. And we're so pleased that you have chosen to, to join to be with us today. My name is Barbara Thomason, and I am the Director of Workforce Development, Business Retention and Expansion. Normally, we would have Jason Gioletti to be with us today. He is the president, but he is on another call right now. If he were here, he would extend a warm welcome to you. So in, in place of Jason, you have me. We decided to do this four part series because we realized that there were many, many business resources out there that you might want to have access to as you rebuild your business during this, this COVID time. And we wanted to have those resources available to you. Some of them had been uh, extended to you and others, had there had been a time lag since they had been extended to you and we wanted to make sure that you had this information in hand. This session four is probably information that you haven't received. This is going to be a fun and interesting session we call creative capacity building. I uh, won't say any more just yet, but I wanted to give you some instruction on how we're going to handle question and answer. First, I want to introduce to you my favorite technology person, Katie Haar. Katie, wave to everybody. <laughs> she is our um, production manager, technical manager during um, the production today, and she's been a tremendous help throughout these, these uh, presentations. So, and she will have a lot to do with the Q&A. So when you want to ask a question, you go to the question and answer dialogue box and you click on it and you can type in your question. You will only see the question once it's answered and you can submit questions anytime during the presentation and we will uh, either answer them, answer them ourselves or we'll prompt the speaker to answer them. And if you don't get your question answered, if you don't think of it uh, during the presentation, we will provide for you presenter contact information at the end of the event so that you might um, reach out to them at a later date. So that's how we'll handle that. So this is our lineup today. We're so pleased to have these experts with us. Corinna Boston Pinalis is the founder and co-owner of Splash Connect Coworking LLC. She's our local superstar entrepreneur. Who'll share her perspectives on success and she has joining her, her mentor, Mr. Jorge Varela, Managing Director of Altus Vista and Chairman and CEO of BioNorth Texas. These two professionals will be followed by Houstonian Connie Maxfield of Maxfield Pro Productivity Consultants on a topic that she introduced to me some years ago and that I got very excited about called Blue Ocean Strategy. And she will tell you much more about that when she joins us. So our first guest presenter is Connie, is Corinna Boston Pinalis, as I mentioned, co-owner of Splash Connect Coworker and a visionary at navigating processes and tools to optimize the people side of change. Splash is a unique business concept operating in San Marcos and the surrounding area. And I'm sure Corinna will reveal much more to you. She has a background in psychology and design and a certification in life coaching from the American Union of Neuro Linguistic Programming. 
She is a shining star under 40 and a distinguished alumna in business development and innovation awarded by the National Hispanic Institute. So Corinna, tell us about your business and how your members are surviving so well. Thank you, Barbara. I really appreciate that welcoming, uh, warm introduction, and the uh, opportunity to be here today with a Greater San Marcos Partnership and our audience. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, which will allow for me to um, present to everyone our presentation today. All right, so we're good. Wonderful. So Splash Coworking, we're the only co-working space in San Marcos, Texas, also known as the Innovation Corridor, uh, coined by Greater San Marcos Partnership and others who recognize the special place that we have here in Texas. Our mission really is to evoke an environment and support entrepreneurs, startups, and anyone really needing to get work done. Our space is a traditional co-working space, which means it's a shared workspace. Uh, we also offer offices and dedicated desks, along with um, conference rooms. We have most recently added uh, a remote office to accommodate those that need a small space just to go in, get some work done, and have that turnkey office environment. Our mission uh, really drives this concept of looking at the individual and looking at the member and hoping to support them through uh, resources and being able to accommodate them in an environment that really creates this opportunity to be self-sustaining and doing that through community. We have here pictured some of uh, our pre-COVID events and trainings um, any ranging for anything from a formal training to our, our meetup sessions that take place. So in light of the subject, creative capacity building, what is that process and what does it look like when you're creating an environment that evokes not only insights, but really provides an application for transformation and regenerative community? I'm going to go over some of the how and how we've got to the place that we're at now. We had to have a very clear vision of what the future of San Marcos looked like and what uh, we wanted to see uh, happen locally um, as a San Marcos local fifth generation. Um, it was really a driving force for not only myself, but my business partner, Perry Sandage, to contribute to our local economy and really support a growing ecosystem that we identified as a need not only for ourselves professionally, but as Texas State graduates and a professional in San Marcos. So having that idea and that vision of what a local ecosystem looked like really played into some of the first uh, ground laying uh, steps towards a local thriving ecosystem. We also had to look at the current reality and the opportunities in that, um, in that reality that San Marcos has. This has um, a lot to do with what Greater San Marcos Partnership does in thinking about what type of jobs or employers that can be brought to San Marcos or in our, in our situation, supported. So really helping those homegrown companies, helping the entrepreneur that has an idea that's going to really contribute to our community and contribute to the solutions that our community needs. So finding and identifying those gaps or those um, challenges that you have locally gives you that pathway to find solutions or to support others that do have those solutions. Speaking about pathways, the other two layers of um, really developing a thriving ecosystem is to identify pathways. So what we found ourselves at Splash was finding pathways through our relationships. Who can we connect with? Who can we really work with that's going to support our mission, understand our vision, and um, has goals and opportunities of their own that complement Splash, but also can be elevated through collaboration. 
So we see that in the form of Texas State University and our relationships there uh, with Greater San Marcos Partnership, specifically with uh, the city of San Marcos, um, other organizations, and then also local opportunities. So local affiliates, local opportunities in the way of meetups or um, other entrepreneurial groups and, and series within our region, not only just San Marcos. Thinking in long-term results and impact, we really weighed in on the opportunity to be connected globally. So we've had a number of opportunities come forward um, that have given Splash a platform to connect with uh, global entrepreneurial organizations, other ecosystems to learn from, and opportunities to connect with startups and entrepreneurs that are outside of the United States that have similar journeys to um, those that are within San Marcos or have lessons learned that they can uh, share with our entrepreneurs. Focusing on innovation driven entrepreneurship in order to strengthen our local economy drives the reasons why we have these global relationships throughout San Marcos um, that uh, connect global organizations to our San Marcos uh, startups and entrepreneurs here at Splash. And what we like to call our members are Splashers because we feel like everyone contributes to the ecosystem at large. And just that one single idea is like a droplet that creates a rippling effect in a positive direction. So speaking of those partnerships and the ecosystem that we've developed, um, Splash Connect, we've had this conversation with Greater San Marcos Partnership and looking at really bringing in the different um, institutions or organizations such as Greater San Marcos Partnership to connect with our Splashers and provide resources um, and really help kind of unite a true evaluation of the needs that um, either our members have or people that are within our community and our, um, our network of, of Splash itself. So we're really looking forward to um, having the consistency of being present with Greater San Marcos Partnership at Splash, but also looking at what that collaboration has as an end goal and how we're gonna help our startups and our entrepreneurs achieve that next phase or that next step that they're looking for. Uh, one of those activation ways of connecting with other organizations is through Global Entrepreneurship Week. So Splash is the community organizer for Global Entrepreneurship Week. And we have an opportunity to focus on um, different events in November and bringing in partners throughout the community to to work on that together in the form of virtual settings, uh, considering that we are in um, post COVID era right now. Uh, we'll be focusing on the healthy entrepreneur and what it takes to support the entrepreneur and um, what a healthy entrepreneur looks like. I encourage you to go to our website where you can sign up and find out more information about our programs that are coming up, specifically what we're doing in partnership with UNEEC. We know COVID has um, provoked a lot of opportunity and um, a need for virtual and digital resources. So with UNEEC, we're going to be providing a program for uh, those that are interested in creating a business or are freelancers or consultants that really want to focus on their career and take it to that next level. So somewhat of a, a miniature incubator program we'll be doing with, um, with UNEEC, supplying business tools and resources in, the, in a digital space. One of the other big announcements that we have is a partnership with iSelectMD. So iSelectMD um, wanted to find a co-working space to have a flagship program to offer telehealth as a membership perk. We know that meta, um, any type of healthcare for those that are freelancers or independent contractors is a challenge. And we had been searching for a solution. And when this opportunity came uh, forward, we were so excited to be considered and much less chosen as the flagship program. So 
if you're a splasher, you'll be able to have the resource of telehealth. And that's something that's um, not readily available to most co-working spaces. And we're very happy for that as an opportunity for our members to have access through telehealth to some of the things that they need. ConnectX Global, they are a group um, that's based in France, but we recently were interviewed um, for a podcast series. And so this is an example of just the consistent opportunities that we reach out and also are um, sought out for uh, here in San Marcos. So some people might think San Marcos is this quiet, sleepy town, but we have uh, about five different languages being spoken in Splash um, at any given day. And we have uh, these relationships outside of Texas, outside of the United States, so we can really explore what opportunities um, are working for ecosystems that are outside of San Marcos and what um, relationships and reflections that we might be able to see within our own ecosystem that are similar or parallels to, to learn from. So kind of to answer what you were speaking to earlier, Barbara, of like, how is it our, um, our members are surviving through this pandemic? Uh, that's what the intent of these series is to provide these resources during a very um, historic and um, just disruptive time that we're all going through. And I think that's key to think about is the fact that this is a time that we're all going through something very similar and, and just experiencing differently. What's unique about the entrepreneur is consistently an entrepreneur's journey is unsettling, unknown, fearful, and very unpredictable. So that's a, a hard wiring to know how to respond to uncertain times. And what we're gonna see during um, this historic time that we're all experiencing are innovations, our solutions, our opportunities. Um, when the pandemic hit, the immediacy of um, response that the entrepreneurial sector had was in our light very natural to see take place because this is their environment. This is something that an entrepreneur um, deals with in a different setting, but very similar on a day to day. So it creates an opportunity for solution driven results um, based off of problems that are, are put right in front of us to solve. So how are our members surviving? Well, they're used to this type of, of response, but what makes it safer for our uh, members to survive is the fact that we've created an ecosystem to support their needs and to support them um, not only on a, on a personal and social level, but also direct them to the resources that they need because of the collaborations and the opportunities that we've been kind of stockpiling the whole time that we've exist in order to support the next level that our um, that our members are needing to to go to. So at this point, I think I had 15 minutes and I don't want to exceed the time. But I'm really excited to um, have Jorge Varela. Um, he's going to join you and I um, during this webinar. Uh, I have had the pleasure and honor of working with him in the capacity of of Splash and him advising and directing and mentoring and coaching us. Um, him being patient with my pie in the sky ideas and, and then bringing me down to a very tactful and strategic way of, of looking at um, the opportunities that, that Splash has presented um, and also what we can really do to help and sustain um, the ecosystem here in San Marcos. I think that's a, a key component of what we're hoping to be um, a supportive element of, but it's, it's the sustainability of entrepreneurship. And I think that we have all the different um, ingredients that we need for our uh, innovation corridor to thrive and be resilient. And I can't wait for you all to hear from Jorge. I'll let him introduce himself a little bit more, but. Um, He's going to speak on the money portion of, and the capital that drives entrepreneurship. And that's usually kind of the meat that everyone's excited for. So Jorge, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and take yeah. it over. 
Thanks, Karina. I am blushing. I know you know lighting in here is not as great as I would expect, but I am blushing. Um, thank you very much for that uh, that intro. Um, I, Karina, Karina's um, Karina's vision is infectious. So uh, don't don't short sell yourself in that. The, the, I think one of the greatest assets that the uh, innovation corridor has is Karina. Um, and, and before I, before I forget, I also wanted to touch on something that's very critical. Um, you know, as, as an entrepreneur myself, and, and I had a number of startups, it's part of a number of startups, um, I, people don't realize how lonely entrepreneurship is and how, 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 how unexpected everything is. So as Karina said, uh, COVID is just another, you know, something else that shows up on their radar. Um, but the beautiful thing about uh, something like Splash Coworking is that you don't have to be alone as an entrepreneur. Um, you, you can lean on each other and uh, in so doing, make the path a little bit easier. So I think one of the greatest assets um, is Splash Coworking. And, and I may have thought it was a little bit crazy when Karina first, first met her and I think it was either uh, Nashville or in Seattle or somewhere. And she says, I'm doing something in, in, uh, in San Marcos. And I said, where? Uh, I mean, I knew San Marcos, I love floating. Uh, the river and, and it just didn't dawn on me that it was a possibility here we are years later and she does have uh, worldwide recognition global recognition for the work that has happened there um so thank you for that because uh you know san marcos is an important part of the, the innovation corridor and i think that it is truly a corridor and, and san marcos is the bridge uh between san antonio and austin uh and in, in, if we could just charge a toll for every time they 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 do business through us, it would be great. Um, uh, thank you also to the Greater San Marcos Partnership for having me here. I, and I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, creative capacity building um, because a lot of people uh, you know, look at this and, and they, they, they think that um, it's, it's a spontaneous thing and it, it happens rather quickly. Uh, I, I got involved in, in this industry um, many years after, I think 10 years after I'd sold my last startup. And I started counseling and mentoring companies in Fort Worth. And I started, at first I said no, but I was asked by a very, uh, a, a very good friend to take a, a shot at it. And I started realizing, um, I said, well, why, why was I successful in my business? And it turned out it was because I had a mentor network. Um, and then I started studying other ecosystems uh, like, Silicon Valley, like Austin, like uh, the 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 the, the, go, the triangle research triangle, um, and I noticed that most of these things happen at a very very slow uh, pace. You know, we 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 think Silicon Valley was a success, but when I was living there in the in the eighties, it wasn't as big as it is today. And and the success for Silicon Valley started during the World War uh, with radar technology and grants that, that, um, that it was able to, to obtain for, for itself and for startups around it. Um, and, and then the encouragement at the university. So one of the key, key elements, and, and Karina says that, you know, San Marcos has a lot of the pieces necessary for moving us forward. Um, and one of those key elements is we do have uh, Texas State there. Um, you have to have research. You have to have innovation-driven entrepreneurship. Otherwise, what happens is uh, you end up with, with a bedroom community that, that doesn't drive economic development. So you have the Texas uh, state, you have the research-driven piece of it, you have the collaborative piece of it with, uh, with Splash Coworking, and I believe that, that there are others that can, that can come into this environment. You have the, the, the local support uh, through GSM, uh, GSMP, through the Better Business, not the Better Business, the Small Business Development Centers, right? And, and so the elements are there, but what, need, what is necessary is a, is a coming together and Splash Connect promises to be that coming together um, that, that will cause uh, the community to have a resource that they can go to um, outside of, of just one place, right? Um, so that, that's an important piece of it. But, you know, Karina and I and, and, and Barry have been going back and forth on how do we bring the next level, the financial level, the financial support that we need into the community. Um, and, you know, the, the, the more I think about it, the, you know, the, the quick answer everyone says is we need an angel investment group. Um, I've helped start angel investment groups across the world. And I think that there is a piece that people tend to forget. 
Um, and that is what we call in the investment world, a non-dilutive uh, uh, non dilutive capital. And so, you know, in researching, again, I, I do a lot of research in the, in the areas of, of economic growth through entrepreneurship. Um, I, I found that most, to the point of about 90% of the capital that early stage companies get come from um, friends and family, uh, either personal uh, loans that they take out through SBA loans. But there is a critical piece of this that, that um, is highly overlooked. And, and this is the grant process um, that, that, is, uh, that is put forth by uh, the federal government and, and to a lesser degree by the state of Texas. But the federal government have these grants, they're called SBIR. Uh, and this is just one example of them, SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research Grants, or STTR, Small, Small Business Technology Transfer Research, which the difference between the two is one is university driven and the other is, is not. Um, but, but, you know, in, in seeking out the right, the right types of companies that we should be nurturing and trying to grow in San Marcos, um, if we look at the, the SBIR grants, uh, these can amount to almost $2 million uh, over two phases. Um, and the way they work is rather simple. Uh, if you have an idea that is innovative that will improve the quality of life or improve the United States as a whole, you can apply for one of these grants with one of 12 agencies. These agencies, the Department of Agriculture, uh, the, the National Science Foundation, where I review grants, uh, the uh, National Institute of Health, the Department, uh, uh, the Navy, the Army, NASA. So there are so many different areas that you can you can find a fit for an idea that you have and you reach out to them with what's called a phase one grant and they give you the outline, literally tell you this is what you need to be able to solve, uh, not technology wise, but to meet the metrics and we will give you a quarter million dollars for the first phase. Um, so that is, that is an incredible asset and, and we need to be promoting uh, those types six months of trying to make this thing work, whatever this invention or this idea that you have, um, if it fails, you owe nobody, you know, you owe no, no money to anyone. Um, so it is, it is rather incredible that, that the asset is there and it's, it's sometimes overlooked and it serves as something. And here's where it gets really interesting because investors, angel investors, uh, don't necessarily like being the first money into a deal. But if the federal government has invested a quarter million or up to, you know, like I said, almost $2 million, then they're more likely to pay attention to it because those grants get scrutinized by, by, uh, by individuals who, who are, uh, are considered by the government, at least, uh, uh, really good at what they do. So, you know, I, they, they choose, they select people across the United States who have deep industry understanding. So if you're, if you're coming up with a new drone technology to spray agricultural free, uh, uh, fields, um, they look at people who understand uh, drone technology, but they also look at people who understand the market in agricultural fields. So it serves as a gatekeeper. Um, and uh, as an investor, I know that if I see that the, the, uh, the grants have come about uh, and funded most of the research, the, 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 the most risky part of, of, of the company's life, and I'm more likely to give. Now, why do I tell you all this? I tell you all this because those type of things amount to about 90% of the monies that companies get. The other 10% are investors, angel investors, and then later venture capitalists and, and private equity funds. Um, but most of it is, is available elsewhere. Uh, and, and I think that we can we can encourage some of that through something like Splash Connect. Uh, it, and we can also encourage some of that through, through partnerships at Texas State. Um, what I have seen some universities do is they create what's called a president's fund. And it's a small $2 million uh, fund over you know, five years. It's not spent all in one year. Where they, where they, they incentivize um, local companies who uh, license comp uh, technology out of the university to, by putting in 35 to 50K in them and tell them, okay, you know, you need to prove this out. 
and go get a grant for the remainder of it and help them with, with getting that grant. I see this all over the country. This is, you can, to this day, you would think that, that, that universities like MIT wouldn't be doing this, but they do it every day and they have a group that supports the entrepreneur in doing this. We at Texas State and, 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 and Greater San Marcos need to think that way. We need to think collaboratively. We need to, to try to, to figure out ways to create uh, innovation-driven entrepreneurship because that's key. Uh, we, we can't be investing in, in restaurants and the restaurants are important, don't get me wrong. We want a very diverse restaurant because people are attracted to that. But, but it, is, it is not the type of uh, investments that outside money will bring in. Um, in, in when we look at, at, at the ecosystem and how Austin built out, Austin was built out through the vision of, of, of one man. I, his name just slipped me. Um, but, but it was a technology company, and he had been successful at it. And so he took his winnings at it and decided he wanted to build out the, the Austin era, er, area. He started out in the 1960s, and only, I would say, maybe 10 years ago did we start considering Austin, Austin a, a hotbed of technology, maybe even less than that. So it took him you know, 30 years to do this. It took Silicon Valley about 70 or 80. It took uh, uh, the, the Research Triangle about 30 as well. Now, I don't think it'll take San Marcos 30 because they've already paved the way we can actually see the models. Um, what we do is we go out and we borrow the ideas and accelerate the pace of doing it. Yeah, we need angel investors, but we also need people to understand that angel investors only invest in technologies that are very innovative and they can sell very, you know, at a very good margin at a very uh, quick pace. They're, they're there to make money. There is one area that's slightly different and that's called social impact investing. Um, social impact investing is very similar to the angel investing marketplace. The difference is, is that um, they care about as much, if, if not more, about the social impact. These are people who are typically um, extremely wealthy. Uh, and so they want, they, they want to make a difference. Uh, they're, they're the, there's a family up in Fort Worth who, uh, whose family has had a propensity for Alzheimer's. So they, they, they have endowed um, a lot of research in that area. And, and you know, those happen, but they're, they're more likely to happen um, in the major metropolitan areas. Now, if you have technology, and this is where being part of something like uh, Splash Coworking is important. If you're part of a community where somebody like Karina can call somebody else like me and say, hey, I have a technology that is in, you know, Alzheimer's, do you know anybody that would be interested in this? They will invest no matter where it is in the world because they're trying to, 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 to stop a, a genetic propensity for Alzheimer's. Um, so they don't care where you're at, they'll fund it. But that networking thread that is a co-working space is important. And I think that, that the promotion of that and, and the willingness to, to work collaboratively um, is what's going to build the ecosystem in, in the greater San Marcos area. How am I doing with time, Karina? Should I take a pause? I think that's my 15 minutes right there. Yeah, I think you're, I think you're good. Barbara, do you have any direction? You can keep going, Jorge, for about five more minutes. Okay. Um, and, and really, there's, there's not much else to do. I think that what, what we need to be able to do is work collaboratively and understand that um, for Texas State to get more research dollars to be able to fund the research, it needs to commercialize technology. For technology to commercialize, it needs uh, investments in the form of grants and or actual um, capital from, from investors. Uh, for that to happen, we need to connect them to, the, to, to each other and, and coach and mentor. So it's, it's one big thing. One cannot happen without the other. Um, and we just have to not be afraid of sharing uh, the reality is, is that even if we don't, as an entrepreneur, I've always said, if I don't win on one deal, I will probably make friends that will help me in the next deal. And that's the way we have to think. And, and I, am, I am excited to, to be here and to be a part of the conversation. I've always felt that there's opportunity um, in, in San Marcos. And I think that opportunity lies uh, very heavily, believe it or not, in water. And, and so appropriately named Splash. 
because of, of the aquifer that we we uh, we have so near us and so below us. Um, so I, I'm I'm excited about it, and I, I stand by to answer questions and, and be supportive in any way I can. Wonderful, Jorge. I could listen to you all day. Maybe Thank you. you. Could, maybe you could do a session on water. <laughs> There's an opportunity there. I would think Texas State, uh, I know they have a water institute uh, or they were working on one at one point. I had spoken to some people there, uh, but it is, it is, water is the next great asset uh, beyond oil. I think that uh, water is, is the most critical asset that we have in San Marcos and Texas State has the aquifer, you know, so it's, we should take advantage of it. Wonderful. Well, we'll be taking some questions later um, if, if some of our participants have them, but thank you so much. That, that was good information, new information, I know, for a lot of people, so thank you. So I'm now pleased to introduce friend and colleague, Connie Maxfield. Connie has helped more than 50,000 people individually and in teams throughout the world achieve performance goals. She has served as a master trainer for the Consortium for Supplier Training, and she is a tier three master trainer for the Texas Leadership Center. She has led projects across a full spectrum of for-profit, non-profit, medicine, NASA, technology, and energy companies. Her most recent work has involved workforce development of Mozambican citizens in preparation for introduction of that nation's first liquefied natural gas plant. Our discussion today covers a subject that she introduced to me that we both find very intriguing that could have a tremendous impact on your business. It's called Blue Ocean, and I'm gonna let Connie explain further. Connie? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, all right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for your time today. I'd like to introduce you to uh, maybe a different way of thinking about your business. And the concept is the Blue Ocean Strategy. And this was first introduced, believe it or not, at, uh, early in the 21st century. And it has now been used in a number of nations and companies, nonprofits, and so on around the world. Kind of builds a little bit on Jorge's, although you are new to me, Jorge, about that. Your, in your work is fascinating to me, but it's an opportunity to think about your business maybe in a little bit of a different way. Uh, it was it initially um, introduced in the sense of working with companies specifically. It was used as a thought of uh, distancing yourself from competition, you know, uh, when there's a lot of red blood in the water, you know, there's a lot of sharks in over competitive markets where there's too many providers of a particular service or product. But I think given what we've seen in the last several months with just everything kind of being up in the air, it's an opportunity, not just from a competitive standpoint, but from maybe a different way to sort of think about your business. So I'm going to introduce it initially, if I can here, with a little two minute video, it'll show it that way. And then I'm gonna show you a couple of examples uh, working through this. So let's see if I can't get this to do what I need it to do, but I think I can, so, okay. All right, so the very first place where I really wanna start with this, I'm only gonna use a couple of slides. Um, and you see it right now on the big part of my screen, but what I wanna show you now is this little video that I think is really going to be helpful. It's about just two minutes. Ms. Connie, I don't think your screen is being shared with the attendees right now. Okay, let me do that then. Hang on just one second and make sure I can do that. Share with screen, there we go. Every system I have worked with, I just came off this Mozambique project a, a couple of months ago. I think my head is still in a different technology right now. So please be great for, in advance for being gracious. Can you see my screen now, Katie? I cannot. Still not. Okay, I pressed share my screen. So let's see here. Okay, let's try that again. Come, and if I can't, I can still walk us through it no matter. So let's see here. So I'm in Zoom. Okay. All right. And to get back out here to the Zoom. There we are. I see Zoom on there. 
Hmm. It's not showing my panel at the bottom. So let's see here, Katie. Um, well, it says that one of our attendees actually can see your screen. So that might be my bad. Um, okay. you wanna I'm go gonna go ahead. <laughs> looks like it's up. Okay, can you see this? Can you see a blue ocean? Can the other panelists see it? Can other panelists see a blue ocean? No, but actually let me go ahead. I can share it for you and Excellent. You let me know when to. Sure. We're gonna show it right now. Okay, and I'll take it to full screen. Okay, Katie? All right, is it good now? There we go. Okay. Oh, wouldn't you know we get an ad? It's not supposed to do an ad. Okay. <laughs> Hang on. No, it isn't. Okay. Well, okay. It was not supposed to do that. All right, one second. Ms. Connie, I can go ahead and share from my screen if you'd like. That'll be great if you'd like to do that. That'll be fine. You see the link here in red? Absolutely. That's our link. I hear it. Can everyone see it? There you go. Excellent, Katie, thank you so much. Can you show my slides then? Can you, and if not, I can, and if we go to full screen, I can show them. Can you see these slides? There you go, that, there you go, perfect, okay. And uh, excellent, so that's what we're looking to see. So what the blue ocean does, as you've seen from the movie and uh, initially, is it says, we're in an industry, so it looks at it your business, and, or it could even be your organization, it could be a nonprofit, for example, and looking at it in terms of what does your industry compete on? And in the few minutes I have here, when Barbara and I first talked about it, I said, oh, there's so much you could cover. But I want to use this example here, and uh, this is a winery, right? Okay. And so I thought that might be a pretty relevant example, given where you are located and so on. Not as important as water for sure, but certainly a growing segment of the market in Texas. So the Blue Ocean Strategy works by looking at what your industry does, what it, is it currently compete on, 
And then you shift your view away from what are we competing against each other for, hence the bloody red ocean, as it were. And it looks at what is it that our non-customers might be interested in. People who are not, either they're not currently in our industry, not buying from us, they've left because they either, we don't give them what, what it is specifically they want, or we've made it harder to do business with us, but maybe they never even heard of us. You know, they never even heard of what our particular uh, industry does. So it looks at that and says, let's shift the way we look at our strategy from competing against others in the same industry that we are in, and instead looking at uh, what we could be offering that we're not offering, what are some things to people who maybe currently are not customers at all, what could we maybe be better offering to our current customers, and how can we create value, where can we innovate on value, produce something that is a win-win. It's a, for example, typically businesses compete on either their differentiation, so more quality at higher value, at higher price, think Neiman Marcus, or less quality typically, not a stereotype, but typically at a lower price store, like a dollar store or a Walmart or something like that. This is how we shouldn't have to make those distinctions in the blue ocean strategy. You can do both. And that's what you look to do is how can we differentiate ourselves and lower our costs? That's one thing. And also your gain is not necessarily someone else's pain. So let's look at this wine example that we've got here. So some of you have probably been in the store and seen people say, for example, in HEB or other stores um, over in the food area where they show the wines and seen the brand Yellowtail and hence the yellow bold language that you see here on the slide. That's how they show that. And so Yellowtail wine really set itself up in a different place. So this uh, chart here is called the Eliminate, Reduce, Raise, Create grid, this kind of four panel grid, if you will. And what it does when you look at wine, for example, in the US at the time, Casella, which is an Australian brand, uh, introduced Yellowtail into the US, they were looking at the wine industry. And some of you may be old enough to remember, I know I certainly am, where wine was really marketed as um, not a typical American drink, it was a more exclusive drink, it was very high end, it was very sophisticated. Uh, the prices varied dramatically, uh, regardless, <laughs> You know, the prices could go from, you know, $5 for one bottle of wine to thousands, millions of dollars, depending upon what they had. And conventional wisdom in the wine industry said that wine, wineries would focus on over-delivering, if you will, on prestige and wine quality and at, at whatever the price point happened to be. So over-delivery, by that I mean in this case, they added a lot of complexity to the wine based on certain, uh, what they call taste profiles. And those taste profiles were shared and honored by winemakers themselves, and they were reinforced by wine judging systems. That's how they were created. So winemakers, show judges, and knowledgeable drinkers all agree that complexity, the layered personality and characteristics that reflect the uniqueness of the soil, the season, the winemaker's skill in tannins, oak, all those kinds of things, processes and everything, makes for quality. Now, so that's one thing, but what Casella did was they said, well, what alternatives are out there? We'd really like to introduce wine to the United States, but this looks like something that's not really of interest or accessible to most people. Most Americans at that time when they looked at the demand side of alternatives of beer, spirits, and ready-to-drink cocktails, those captured three times the market of wine Most uh, in the U.S. Most U.S. consumer alcohol sales of wine, people saw wine as intimidating and pretentious, for example. Uh, it created some flavor challenges in terms of the profiles. People didn't understand all of that oaks and tannins and the soil. It wasn't that important to most Americans at that time. Our wine interest for most people was not that, not that developed, not that sophisticated. And so in this particular tool that you would use, and it's one of many, what Casella found in this one, 
they said, well, in the very first one, it, elimination, it says, well, which, the question is, which factors should be eliminated? What are some factors on which the industry competes and takes for granted because it's what everybody in the industry compares itself against everybody else in the industry? Uh, even if customers no longer value that, don't care about that. So in eliminating it, what Casella did was they said, we're going to eliminate all this wine terminology, this sophisticated wine terminology that most people don't know and frankly don't care about. They would, uh, they would eliminate the really elaborate, high-level, expensive uh, person in the, you know, ridiculously expensive automobile and the mansion house and all that kind of thing. And they would also eliminate the aging qualities because, frankly, most people didn't really know the difference. It didn't really matter to them. Now, does that mean that there aren't people out there who do know those things and, you know, does matter to them? Of course. But they're trying to introduce another alternative to beer, spirits, and cocktails uh, and make wine something that everyday people would, would consume. They're trying to grow a market here. So that's what they got rid of. So you would ask yourself that same kind of question, looking at my industry, what, what are we over delivering on that uh, customers and people who are even non-customers that we've never talked to might be interested in? Uh, but it, and so you're doing a lot of brainstorming and thinking and some research. You're going to talk to people about that. And the, uh, the Blue Ocean Strategy shows you step by step how to do that. They then look at reduce. And so reduce, the question would be, well, which factor should be reduced well below the industry standard? Which products or service have been over-designed in the race to match at least the competition? You know, the focus was on the competition not necessarily the customers and non-customers who are at that. And what that results in is over-serving customers, increasing the cost structure of what you're doing for no particular benefit, no real gain. So in, what Casella looked at in this example was they said, okay, vineyard prestige and legacy um, doesn't have to be eliminated, certainly, but it should be reduced because for most people it was not that important. They were not uh, necessarily knowledgeable enough for that to make, make, it, make a difference, to pay all this extra money, add all this extra cost to production. Uh, wine complexity wasn't that big a deal for most people. So it didn't mean get rid of it. You can't get rid of it or you don't have wine, <laughs> but, but you don't need to have this level of complexity for, for the customers they're trying to reach, the current non-customers. And this whole range of wines uh, at various price points and so on. That's not what Casella was trying to do in introducing wine as simply an alternative to Americans as a drink, a social drink. Now, they said, well, what should be raised, okay? So the question there would be, well, which factor should be raised well above the industry standard? In other words, what the industry's, uh, you know, what they're accepting is okay at this point, and that gets you to uncover and eliminate maybe some compromises the industry forces customers to have to make. A good example of that today would be in the uh, pandemic situation, certainly where I am in the Houston area, uh, the fact that people are now buying their cars over the phone and online and all that, they don't have to come into the dealer anymore, right? So that's going to be a big game changer, I think, even after all this is done. I'm not a psychic, but I think that's an option. So one of the things they said we, we need to raise is price versus budget wines, because people saw budget wines as rot gut, you know, kind of stuff. They didn't want to drink a wine that was considered, you know, cheap, but they didn't, at the same time, didn't want to, didn't know that they knew enough to say, I need a $75 bottle of wine. I need something that's a reasonable price. I can serve at dinner with my family or a party when I'm entertaining, but I don't have to have this enormous expanse of choices. And I don't want rot gut. I don't want that. So that's a stereotype I'll throw on him. Then finally, the fourth bucket looks at creating and it says, which factor should be creating, should be created that the industry has never offered before. So it's not looking at just your business, it's looking at the industry. And that helps you discover a completely new sources of value for buyers and create new demand and shift the strategic pricing, the way the industry prices. So 
when Costello looked at what should be created, they said it should be something that is easy drinking. We don't need a lot of fancy equipment and all that kind of thing. It should be tasty for people to enjoy, not something that they wouldn't normally buy. It would be just as easy as buying a beer or buying a cocktail and so on, a ready-made cocktail. Selection should be simple. And you see people in the uh, retail grocery stores selling it and they are not wine sommeliers and so on. These are everyday people who are doing other food tasting <laughs> kinds of things that you would normally see in a routine grocery store. They trained the, the retail store support so the people like where I am, the HEB people could easily introduce it to people and uh, offer enough information to re respond to questions people had without having to have a PhD necessarily, as much as I value that. That's not what was needed for this. And then finally, it should be fun. They wanted something that made it attractive instead of it being overly sophisticated and maybe uh, too distant for most everyday people. They said, well, we want something that has a little bit of fun and adventure. And you see the kangaroo on the bottle and so on. So when they did that, um, what the way Casella saw it was instead of offering wine as wine, the way people knew it, they offered a social drink, basically, that was accessible to everybody. Beer drinkers, cocktail drinkers, wine drinkers, everyone. And in the space of only two years, with no promotional campaign, no mass media, no consumer advertising at all, the fun social drink Yellowtail emerged as the fastest growing brand in the histories of both the Australian and the US wine industries. And the number one imported wine into the US surpassing both France and Italy. Now I'm not necessarily saying that that's exactly what's gonna happen with your business, but I wanna show you an example of the thinking that goes into it. So you could say, well, you know, what are we doing in my, in my industry, not just my business, but my business works within the context of an industry. And when I look at that, what is it that, you know, we're providing people that maybe they don't really want anymore. Maybe there's a whole market out there of people who are not customers, maybe never heard of us or heard of what our industry even does, who might be interested if we were, if we provided some service that we currently don't offer. Where can we lower our cost structure and where should we raise things? And this tool allows you to do it. Then the next slide, if you will, Katie, I know I'm tight on my time here, so I'll just take another few minutes. Um, so how could you learn more about this? So um, they mentioned, of course, you saw probably in the video, the Blue Ocean Strategy, which was the original book that was created, um, came out in 2005, two professors at INSEED, which I'm, I'm sure some of you would be familiar with, but they're the business school um, at Fontainebleau near Paris, but they're called, the, I love it, they're called the business school for the world. And people come there literally, not just students, but faculty come from all over the world to study and to conduct research. They then updated the book after they, in 2017, came out with a new version, an updated version. By then they had, it had been used all over the world. Uh, governments are using it, nonprofits, for-profits and so on, looking at how they can kind of break free from the competitive, competitiveness of, of the, an industry, a particular industry. It uh, was published in a record-breaking uh, 44 languages, Polish, Czech, Vietnamese, everything, everything you could imagine. Their research institute there at NSEED where um, these books have come and the shift, by the way, the book Strategy introduces you to the whole concept and how to do it and lots of great examples and so on. The shift tells you how to do it. So the first book is more about the what, the shift is more about the how. And uh, so I would certainly recommend both and no, I don't get a kickback. It's just, the, just good information, I think. The Research Institute there uh, were, you know, does work for all kinds of organizations, for-profit, non-profit, government agencies, but they also have a social element to them too um, for the developing world. And that's probably a you know, big piece of where my heart is, but to mitigate poverty and to improve education and health. And they've done a lot of really good work in that area. Um, so they are using the Blue Ocean Strategy as a way to help developing nations too, any kind of emerging uh, market or group, if you will, to be able to offer more in an affordable way. 
I know the Malaysian government has worked with them, but lots of other governments as well. So the scholars are continuing to do this research. And uh, I think probably on the last slide, if you will, Katie, I'll just highlight a couple of things here. You can go to the web. If you can go out on the web and just simply go to blueoceanstrategy.com, there are just endless resources on how to do this and uh, why to do this and lots and lots of examples. And I just did this click here, if you will, this little print from the screen, but they will, it'll say, who's talking about the blue ocean strategy? And it will give you um, dozens and dozens and dozens. You'll see lots of faces and you can click on any one of these faces and they will tell their story. That individual will tell their story about how they're using it in their particular context. Um, you can also go to Blue, Strate uh, Blue Ocean Strategy as well. That's another site. And then finally, INSEED, I-N-S-E-A-D, INSEED.edu. And that's their center spelled the French way, the European way, C-E-N-T-R-E-S, Blue Ocean Strategy. And you can go there. And if you wanted to learn more about this, it's not just about competition. I think it's when everything is up in the air, you can look at how you may want to rethink a little bit about your business and what you put out in the marketplace, what you're offering. But they have a blog. They have hundreds, probably thousands now of case studies that you can look at from a whole variety of different perspectives, whatever your area of interest is. They have an um, electronic library that has over 2000 management and academic articles on the Blue Ocean Strategy. They have an app for the iPad that you can use where, that has the tools. You don't have to recreate the tools they have. You can just download them for free. They want this to be available to the public. Um, they have a newsletter that they publish. They have teaching materials for, ac for academics. So professors and so on, uh, teachers who want to use this material in the classes that they are offering at their uh, universities and so on. All of this information is out there. People can also go on and be certified if they want to take training in how to do this um, and become certified through Blue Ocean. I did not do that at the time uh, for this application where we were using it, where Barbara and I were working together. But I was able to do it from the books and from these other resources that they provided. I looked at a number of case studies. I looked at materials. Um, I get their, their newsletters and articles and so on because they're fascinating to see what people are, are doing with this kind, of, this kind of resource. So it is something that you can do um, and it gives you step-by-step step the tool to use, how to use the tool, why to use it, when to use it, and so on. And then you can, uh, how to meet with customers that maybe you've never talked to before, potential customers and so on. And it really guides you through this whole process. So that's um, the taste that I was hoping to give you, I think, in this little bit of time I have. Um, they have a YouTube channel. That's another thing I didn't mention, I guess. So a wealth of information just to uh, kind of get you to think about it in maybe a new way, a fresh way. And uh, there's a great thought that when uh, nothing is certain, everything is really possible. And I think that this is a great time uh, for us in the United States and in the world right now to be able to do that, to, to consider things from a fresh, a fresh perspective. So I welcome any questions that you have. Happy to answer anything you have. Uh, Barbara, Katie, I'll turn that back over to you. Thank you so very much, Connie. That was very good information. And it's true, we've had a lot of disruption in our world. And um, because of that, it might be that it's time for us to embrace disruption and to use some of this good information that we've had to, to do a controlled disruption. Yeah. So this, <laughs> this is a good time for uh, any additional questions or um, you can pose it in the chat or in the Q&A box if anybody can, would like to do that. Not at this time. I'm just checking some of those places. Okay, no questions right now. Uh, then I am going to 
put up on the screen. I'm gonna clear my screen. The contact information. Whoops. For our presenters today and myself, if any of you have any questions of me, so that you can reach out to these folks. If you have questions of Jorge, we suggest that you reach out to Corinna so that um, she can be an intermediate for intermediary for him. Um, I want to ask you all if you would please take just a second to fill out a little three question poll and it will take you just a minute to answer these three questions. We do take the polls quite seriously. It helps us do a better job. And because the poll doesn't allow for an open-ended essay type question, I would invite you to send me by email if you have ideas for future webinars, information that you would like to see presented uh, through this medium, please email me. I'd love to hear from you. That's Barbara T at greatersanmarcustx.com. We have just a few more people that need to vote. So we're waiting for you. Couple more. Thank you. All right. Thank you all so much for logging in. And again, if there's ever anything that the Greater San Marcos Partnership can do for you, please let us know. This webinar will be posted on our website and on our YouTube channel so that you can find it later if there's a detail that you missed. You all have a blessed day. Take care. And thank you presenters as well. We appreciate your time. We know it's very valuable. Thank you. Honored to thank you so much. Was able to show. Appreciate it. It was really great to hear everything you shared, Connie. Thank you. You bet. Thank you all so much. It was interesting for me too. Always, always learning. Always mm -hmm. learning. Thanks. I like how we all had a, a water current going through our presentations. <laughs> <We did. laughs> That's, That's right. good.